Okay. Bon, ben, bienvenue euh, à toutes et à tous. Euh, alors, c'est notre première euh, session de séminaire en ligne, donc j'espère que tout va bien se passer. Euh, nous avons fait des tests euh, hier, euh, la semaine dernière et, et hier. Donc, bienvenue à tous et à toutes. Euh, donc, nous avons le plaisir pour ce premier euh, séminaire euh, général euh, à l'occasion de la procédure de, de sélection de quelqu'un pour euh, un poste euh, en physique et information quantique. Nous avons donc le plaisir d'accueillir Manuel Gessner. Is it how I... It's, it's good. Gessner. Yes, ah, Gessner, yes, I wasn't sure. Okay, so, uh, well, let's speak to English. Uh, Manuel speaks French, but he is uh, going to be this talk in English. So, uh, Manuel uh, graduated from the University of uh, Fargo, I think. Yeah, and uh, he, and, uh, and he uh, yeah, spent first the uh, first postdoc in uh, in Florence, Florence, uh, and now he's a junior uh, researcher in uh, LKB, uh, Laboratoire Castel Brosser in Ecole Normale in Paris, and uh, we have the pleasure to discover him and to learn what he's doing. So those of you who don't know yet. Uh, so, Emmanuel uh, will speak about quantum parameter estimation from fundamental to technology. And so, welcome, Gaston, and it's up to you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it's really a pleasure for me to be invited here and to be given the opportunity to present my research field and also some of my results. So, in this talk, I will mostly focus on quantum parameter estimation which is a general theoretical framework that has uh, a lot of interesting applications with um, quantum systems in general. And its theoretical framework is deeply rooted in the fundamentals of quantum information theory, but it also has very important applied um, applications. Uh, it has very important applications in technology, um, which I will also introduce to you. So before I will dive into the field of quantum parameter estimation, I want to give you a bit of the bigger picture of quantum information theory. And this is a field that lives very much from the exchange between experimentalists and theorists. And a lot of the experimental setups that are being built today are motivated by theoretical proposals. And also the theory that we do is strongly influenced by the experimental possibilities that are um, existing or that will exist in the near future. So I have a, a bit of a collection here of experimental systems that typically I think of for doing quantum information. And many of them actually have also a long history in the Paris area and have been developed to a large extent here. So we have on one hand, of course, um, quantum optical systems of photons. Then we have a cold atomic systems that is a, a huge uh, area of research. I have taken this picture here from uh, Antoine Beauvais group, who is also a member of Université Paris-Saclay. And for example, they specialize in developing these optical tweezer traps where they can arrange atoms in three-dimensional trap geometries and also control the interactions between them. Then we have trapped ion systems that typically work with a bit of a smaller number of particles than atomic systems, but they also have a bit of a better control over the quantum state. And then cavity QED systems are formally very similar also to trapped ion systems. Um, and they're also kind of dual to each other. So in, in trapped ions, for instance, we typically uh, use light to control the quantum state of matter of ions in this case. And in cavity QED, you send atoms through um, a cavity to control the quantum state of light between these two mirrors. And actually, Serge Roche from, from LKB, where I'm working at the moment, he got the Nobel Prize for cavity QED developments together with David Weinland, who developed the technology for trapped ions. So they're really quite similar. And then at CEA, you also have the group of Daniel Estev, who has contributed to the development of circuit QED systems, which again are very similar to cavity QED systems on a formal level, on a mathematical level, but a completely different physical structure. And I could go on here uh, for a while, but I think you get the picture. So these are mainly the experiments that I'm thinking of. And uh, what they all have in common is that we have quantum degrees of freedom that we can control with a very high level of coherence. In particular, we can also 
control the correlations and engineer correlations between different degrees of freedom and different particles. And that allows us to do a lot of interesting things in quantum information theory. And typically, this is summarized today under the term of quantum technology. So these are all possible applications of quantum information theory that are in principle possible with systems of this type. And in the European flagship, uh, they have been categorized in these four categories. So we have metrology and sensing, simulations, communication, and computation. And my own research mostly focuses on metrology and sensing and also simulations. Um, sometimes one speaks of a second quantum revolution um, when one speaks about these new quantum technologies because already we have technologies that make use of coherence, for example, but the idea is really here to make use of the correlations that are way beyond the reach of classical systems to, to really implement ideas from quantum information theory. And of course, the first um, necessary condition for us to be able to use these systems for quantum technologies is to understand well the theory and the physics of these quantum systems. And I want to give you a bit of an idea of what physics we can look at. So I will take the example of trapped ions um, to show you how versatile and, and how rich the physics can be um, that we as theorists can, can study uh, motivated by such experimental platforms. So if we have a single trapped ion, ion we have, um, first of all, an internal electronic degree of freedom that is described by a two-level system like a spin one-half particle, but also the ion moves in the trap and uh, that gives rise to a continuous degree of freedom, so a um, harmonic oscillator. So these are the elementary Hilbert spaces usually that we work with to encode in quantum information. And then if we have multiple of these ions, we can control correlations between such degrees of freedom. So you can already see that as uh, theorists, we need mathematical uh, methods that can deal with the smallest non-trivial Hilbert spaces of just two levels and also with Hilbert spaces that are continuous, unbounded, um, contain unbounded operators and infinite dimensional. And we need to span this whole, whole range of, of systems. Then we can use laser interactions to control each of these degrees of freedom to uh, um, the single quantum level, essentially. And this allows us to do a lot of different interesting things. And I want to give you a bit of an overview of different topics that I have worked on um, here at the example of trapped ion systems, just to illustrate the, how, how broad the range of these systems can be. So for, for example, in this collaboration that we did with the group um, of Pete Schmidt in Hannover in Germany, um, we have used this, this laser control of the external degree of freedom to create non-classical states of motion that are extremely sensitive to small forces that act on the ion. And that would be one example of metrology and sensing, for instance. But what is interesting that if you look at this system and you completely change the parameters um, of the laser, for example, of the trap, and you look at different observables, you can get a physics that is completely different. And then in this recent collaboration between theorists and experimentalists, we showed that if you, if you operate the system in a completely different parameter regime, you can actually use it to mimic the evolution of electrons that transfer between parts of a molecular system. So completely different physics. And uh, this gets even more interesting and complex if we look at the many body physics by putting multiple ions together in the trap. So each of these ions is positively charged. And that means when you move one of them, the other ions will also feel that. And there will be collective modes of motion because they are all repelling each other due to the Coulomb force, right? So you, you have collective modes of, of vibration in such a chain of ions. And this allows you to study the phonon dynamics, for example, which is something that we did in this collaboration with the trapped ion group of uh, University of California in Berkeley. And this is the actual picture of the ion chain that we studied with 42 ions. So you can see you can easily go to regimes where the Hilbert space becomes so large that we can no longer keep track of all the microscopic details in these systems. And the collective coupling of these ions through the phonons can also be used to engineer effective spin-spin interactions and uh, that allows you to study spin chain models, which is something 
that has been proposed originally by Porras and Tirak uh, in 2004. And you can show that this gives you easing models with long range interactions. And we've also collaborated with theoretical groups that have more of a background in condensed matter and uh, mesoscopic systems to develop a semi-classical spin wave theory for such an easing model with long range interactions motivated by these systems here. So in these systems, you can tune the interaction between the spins and you can tune the strength of a transverse field. And depending on which of these two terms dominates, the quantum state, the ground state of the system can have completely different properties. And there will be a critical value of the ratio between the two at which there will be an abrupt change of the properties of the ground state of the system. And this is called a quantum phase transition, which is yet another area of research that is quite rich and interesting and um, can also be studied, for example, in, in cold atomic systems. And this is also things that we have looked at in the past. Now, if you go to more realistic situations, you have to take into account the possibility that these parameters may not be as ideal as you want them to, so there could be some fluctuations. For example, the resonance of each of these two-level systems is determined by an external magnetic field, and if that fluctuates, you'll get some collective dephasing effect. So we've studied this dephasing effect to exploit some symmetries that allow us to protect quantum entanglements or specific type of quantum correlations from decaying, because typically this dephasing that it destroys the coherence in the quantum correlations. And uh, this is already part of a, of a bigger field that is known under the term of open quantum systems. So they were interested in the evolution of a small set of degrees of freedom that is in contact with a large, typically uncontrollable environment. And this is also an active area of research in theory. There's uh, some fundamental questions about the information flow between a system and its environment. And this is something that can also be studied under controlled conditions with uh, trapped ions and uh, something that we did in particular, we looked at how information flows from the system into the environment and into the system environment correlations. Now we can retrieve that. And then we can even go to much more complex systems. So in some cases, we also pursue statistical approaches. And in this case, for example, we used some methods from random matrix theory to analyze uh, the generic dynamics of complex open quantum systems. So this uh, is just to give you an idea of how broad the range of possible physical topics are that we can study in theory related to these systems. But uh, in this talk, I will now just focus on applications in metrology and sensing. And now on the next slide, I will motivate and introduce this field. So this is typically known as quantum metrology. And I can motivate this just by asking a very simple fundamental question. So assume that you have a quantum system, many body system perhaps, that is characterized by a set of parameters. And you would know, like to know these parameters with the best possible precision. So a fundamental question is, what are the limits on the precision that we can achieve for these parameters? And also, what are the observables that we should measure that give us the most information about these? Also, perhaps in what type of quantum states should I prepare my system to be most sensitive to these parameters? So these questions are typically answered in the framework of quantum information theory. And they, of course, have a lot of interesting applications uh, in First of all, precision measurements, which are important for all sorts of fundamental tests of physics, but also for the characterization of quantum many body systems, because in, in such large many body systems with many degrees of freedom, you cannot get the full microscopic description, but there may still be some decisive parameters that give you the information that you really need. And then the question is, how do we get these parameters with the best precision? So this is why uh, for the characterization of models and states, this could also be interesting. And this is, of course, important for the implementation of ideas from quantum information. What limits the precision in these systems are typically, eventually, when you have eliminated all the technical sources of noise, the quantum fluctuations. They are. They cannot be avoided, but we can, in many cases, use tricks from quantum information to reduce their impact such that they don't bother us as much. And then also quantum correlations are uh, typically the reason why it's hard to characterize large scale many body systems. And in this case, looking at the sensitivity of such a quantum system can also tell us something about its quantum correlations, as we will see in the course of this colloquium. So uh, it can also go 
backwards. So you can go both way here. Um, okay, so even if you've never heard of quantum metrology, there's one application of it that you may have heard of, which was uh, recently quite a lot in the discussion and scientific discussions, which is the usage of squeezed light in gravitational wave detectors, like, uh, for example, at Virgo or at LIGO. And um, so these are essentially optical interferometers that can be depicted like this. This is a typical textbook depiction of a macht interferometer. And uh, you use a laser, send it onto a beam splitter, and then there will be a relative phase shift between the two arms. Then you recombine them, and then you measure the photons that come out to estimate the parameter of this, of this uh, phase shift. Um, but there's something wrong with this picture. There's something missing, namely, there is no such thing as a completely dark input port in this uh, beam splitter. So even if we completely block it, we will still be sending in a quantum mechanical vacuum state. And we know that the vacuum is not really empty in quantum mechanics. So if we represent the vacuum state in phase space, uh, we know that there's some area of uncertainty. So I apologize that the picture looks a bit strange. That's because I had to export it to a PDF. But um, you get the idea. So there's some area of fluctuations here that is due to Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. And uh, you can now uh, go to a quantum description of this interferometer evolution. Uh, and in this quantum description, we only have one mode because uh, the, the other mode is populated by a laser, which is a strong coherent state. So it's essentially in the mean field limit. So we can describe everything that happens on, on the level of a single mode and eventually this is just a displacement of this mode that is proportional to this phase shift. So we try to estimate how far did the vacuum get displaced. And so you can see when the phase shift is small, the fluctuations of the vacuum will limit our ability to identify the value of theta. And therefore, Carton Caves in 81 had the idea to use squeezed vacuum states where you reduce the quantum fluctuations at the relevant direction, so to speak, in phase space. Of course, at the expense of extreme of, of increased fluctuations in a different direction, but we don't care about those because they don't limit our measurement. So now I want to look at this idea of squeezing, and, and this is precisely what is done now in, in um, gravitational wave detectors. So I would like to look at this now from a more abstract point of view. So let's say we have n particles that we send into some general interferometric process. So each of these particles can pass through one of the two quantum states here. So essentially, all of them are described as two level systems. And then the collection of all of these particles is described by a collective angular momentum algebra. And you can show that the evolution of the, of the interferometer is nothing else but a, a rotation of this collective angular momentum. So the idea would be to estimate the angle of rotation here. And also the measurement that we do for this estimation is the measurement of one component of the angular momentum algebra. And formally, this is equivalent to Ramsey spectroscopy, so the standard operating scheme of atomic clocks, for example. So where this n could be n atoms that we use in an atomic clock. So um, you can represent the quantum state of such n two-level systems on a collective Bloch sphere. And you can show that if you use all of these particles individually without correlations, the best sensitivity you can achieve by a coherent spin state that has such a quasi probability distribution on the Bloch sphere. So you can clearly see there are also some quantum fluctuations involved here. And they will, when we eventually measure the projection on the y axis after a rotation around z, which is this one, will limit our ability to resolve the phase. So this is what limits also atomic clocks. And so, therefore, the idea would be to use squeezed spin states also to improve atomic clocks, which is something I want to um, explain to you now. So first of all, I would like to show you how we can make the quantum gain that we can achieve by using such a squeezed state quantitative. So how can we quantify the gain that we have? So for that, I would like you to consider a very specific and very simple method to estimate a parameter in a quantum experiment. So assume that you measure one observable x, so a generic operator, and it depends on the quantum state rho which uh, is a function of the parameter theta that you're interested in. And you know how, in principle, the expectation value should change as a function of theta because you've calibrated your apparatus or you have a theoretical model that predicts it. 
So this is a calibration curve that you know, and then you can do a bunch of measurements of this operator X. From these measurements, you can take the sample average and put it on the Y axis of your calibration curve. And then from the intersection here, you can estimate the true value of theta that was probably present when you took this data. So there will be some error associated to this very simple estimation procedure, which is due to the fluctuations of the sample average. And the fluctuations of the sample average, we can assume that we're operating in the central limit. So we do a large number of repeated measurements under identical conditions. And then this will be a normal a Gaussian distribution. And the variance will uh, decrease with the number of measurements and will be uh, most importantly given by the variance of this operator. So we can put these fluctuations now here on the y-axis and then we check how this propagates onto the error for the estimation that we do. And the way that this propagates, you can see visually here depends on the gradient at this intersection here. So you can calculate exactly that the estimation error will be given by the ratio of the variance and the absolute value of this gradient squared. So this is the, a simple error propagation formula but that shows you that how the, the variance of an operator and its dependence on the parameter um, influences the sensitivity we can achieve from it. So let's apply it now to this Ramsey spectroscopy measurement or to a generic interferometer measurement. So we have a specific operator that we measure and we know how the operator changes because it's just uh, Schrodinger's equation that we use here. And uh, inserting all of that here, we see that the essential quantity that characterizes the sensitivity is just the inverse of the error here, modulo this, this factor that we don't care about so much at this point. And we obtain something that is known as the spin squeezing parameter that was first introduced by David Wineland in 92. So by the way, David Wineland is the trapped iron um, guy who got the Nobel Prize together with um, Sasha Roche in, in 2012. So this is um, how we can quantify the quantum gain that we can achieve from squeezing. You can see when the variance is small, um, then you get a better sensitivity. And uh, soon after that, um, it was realized that when you have uh, access to nonlinear time evolutions, for example, a quadratic Hamiltonian, you can transfer a coherent spin state into a squeezed spin state. And then there have been proposals more specifically, for example, with trapped ions and both Einstein condensates on how such a nonlinear evolution can be generated using the available laser systems and interactions that we have. And this has really opened up a huge area of research. And you can uh, see a summary of experimental results here in this plot, which is from this recent review. And they show here as a function of the number of particles, the quantum gain that has been reported in these experiments. So you can see here trapped ion systems, both Einstein condensates and cold thermal atoms. So I would like to explain to you uh, a bit more in detail how this works with the quantum gain and also what are the limits of the spin squeezing idea, which is mostly what people used in, the, in all of these experiments. So spin squeezing is really the standard method here to achieve a quantum gain. So I will use the spin squeezing parameter to quantify the sensitivity as we've discussed before. So I, the only modification is that I'm optimizing now over all possible directions of this rotation and the measurement to make sure that we're catching the right uh, squeezed direction of the state. And I make a small modification to the nonlinear evolution um, by adding a transverse field also of a specific strength. This is just because this gives us squeezing on the fastest possible time scales, which is something that we showed in this paper here. And this Hamiltonian has a very nice classical, semi-classical interpretation as well. So these are the classical trajectories on the block sphere. And you can see there's an unstable fixed point here. This is where we're going to put our initial coherent state. And then it has to follow these trajectories, the separatrix, and thereby it will eventually get squeezed. This is uh, simply how it, how it works. So the idea would be to put this nonlinear evolution before the interferometric measurement and then use the squeezed state that we get at the end of this evolution for quantum enhanced sensing. So let's see what we get. So this is the sensitivity as a function of the time that we apply the nonlinear evolution and quantified by the spin squeezing parameter. So it will grow, it will reach a maximum when the state looks like this. This is again the uh, Wigner function, a quasi probability distribution plotted on the block sphere. And you can clearly see this looks squeezed and uh, it starts to wrap around this separatrix structure. 
and then there's a maximum at this point but if we now continue this nonlinear evolution the sensitivity will go down so the typical way that spin squeezing is used in experiment is they stop at this point and so the question that we've been asking ourselves is is it really the case that the states after longer evolution times for this nonlinear Hamiltonian become less sensitive or maybe are we are we missing something so we can look at the states also that we get at longer times. And of course, they will, they will wrap further around this trajectory and there will be very fine interference fringes, um, which make the state look rather complex at longer times. But these very fine interference fringes, they indicate that when you do a very small rotation of the state, it should be very sensitive to small rotations. So in principle, we expect to be able to find a hidden um, gain here that is just not captured by this approach. And the reason that it's not captured is if you look at this expression for sensitivity, it is just uh, made of first and second moments of the uh, of linear operator. So essentially it's a Gaussian expression. It just tries to characterize the features of the state by looking at the variance of the collective angular momentum. And so this state here, if you know the variance in this direction and that, you know everything. So this is essentially a Gaussian state, but this is no longer the case here. The variance has actually increased again. So the idea is the measurement of a linear operator is just not adequate to characterize these more complex states. And for this reason, we have extended the idea of spin squeezing to nonlinear observables as well. And we've developed a method that allows us to identify observables for such quantum enhanced precision measurements analytically that are optimal as a function of all possible observables that you could measure. So we get a generalized version of the spin squeezing parameter. And we can use this, for example, to optimize over not only linear observables, but also second order measurements of the collective angular momentum. And if we do that, we see that we are able to capture a much higher quantum gain by looking at states that are non-Gaussian, that have uh, been squeezed for longer times. And the higher we go with the measurement, of higher moments, the more sensitivity we can extract. So this is really uh, due to the better characterization of the complex feature of these states. So at some point, so this is by increasing the moments, we can get better and better sensitivity. And at some point you can ask, so what is the, the ultimate limit of this simple estimation method? So what, what if I can measure really any quantum observable at all? What is the maximum? And this we can also calculate analytically and what is interesting is that we recover a quantity that is very well known in quantum metrology and it's known as the quantum fissure information. I will explain it in the next slide, but I will already show you what it looks like. The, the quantum fissure information is this black line here. And all you need to know for the moment is that the quantum fissure information really characterizes the full sensitivity of the quantum state. So if you can make an optimal measurement and also an optimal estimation strategy, then this is the, the highest possible sensitivity you can get from a given quantum state. So that means even if we measured other operators, we could never get beyond this black line. And that shows us that this moment-based approach is actually able to extract the full sensitivity of the state. OK, so um, what is the interpretation of this Fisher information? To do that, I need to take a step back and um, look at this problem from a more abstract point of view. So we will now no longer just focus on a, on a very specific estimation protocol, which was based on the expectation value of one observable, but now we will take this um, to the, the most abstract level. So we just say there is a quantum state that depends on a parameter. We do some kind of measurement and then uh, we obtain results that in quantum mechanics will be distributed randomly according to Born's rule. And now we would like to estimate the value here. And uh, from this, from the fluctuations and the distribution of the measurement results that, are, that we have, we can predict the limits on, on the sensitivity that we can achieve for the parameter theta. And this is just from classical theory of parameter estimation. And you can show that the ultimate limit for arbitrary uh, measurements is given by one over the square root of this function, which is the Fisher information. So this is just a function of your distribution of measurement results. And uh, so this really tells you there is no method that can give you a better precision. And if you saturate this, you have done the optimal processing of the data that has this distribution. 
it, it also has a really nice information theoretic interpretation, which I want to show you briefly. So the Fisher information, you can interpret it if you look at the distribution of the measurement data for different values of this parameter theta. So for one value theta one, you may get the green distribution of measurement results. For theta two, you get the black distribution of results. And now each of these probability distributions we can represent in an abstract space of probability distributions where we can introduce the notion of statistical distance that just tells us how distinguishable are these distributions. And once we have a distance, we can also look at the derivative of the distance and that we can interpret as a measure of statistical speed. And this is precisely what the Fisher information is. It tells us how quickly do my measurement data change when I have a small variation of the parameter that I'm interested in. And, and that's the reason that it's inversely proportional to the error that you can make in an ideal case. But so far, all of this is characterized just in terms of a classical probability distribution. We can get classical probability distributions from, from any stochastic process. You don't necessarily have to relate it to a quantum measurement problem. But here we want to really characterize the properties of the quantum state. In quantum information theory, we really try to extract the information at the level of states and not at the level of probabilities. But the problem is that the probability depends on the choice of the measurement, which could be just simply a bad choice. So to get rid of this, what we do in quantum information theory is we optimize such quantities over all possible measurements. And then by performing an optimal measurement, we can formally convert the space of classical probability distributions in a space of quantum density matrices of quantum states and the statistical distance then uh, is given by the fidelity of these quantum states, a quantum statistical distance. And in the same way, we can get the quantum statistical speed, which is uh, then the quantum Fisher information. So the maximum Fisher information extractable by all measurements. And therefore, this determines the ultimate limit of sensitivity because this is not only optimized over all ways that you can estimate, but also over all measurements that you can do on your system. Right, so this is known as the kramer rao bound or the quantum kramer rao bound that determines the, the ultimate sensitivity limits. So let me just uh, review what we have so far. We have the full metrological sensitivity that is given by the quantum Fisher information, but we also had these very convenient lower bounds um, that we just get from a simple idea of squeezing. Um, they, of course, they may only work for simpler classes of states. However, they're really important as well for practical applications because the, the full sensitivity may be hard to access. The optimal observable is in practice not always something that is simple to measure and can even be hard to calculate. Whereas these bounds are very easy to access just from the measurement of one operator, which we can also optimize analytically. And uh, we have a nice interpretation that uh, the, the smaller the variance, so the more this operator is squeezed, the better the sensitivity will be. All right. So from the sensitivity of quantum states, there's lots of information we can extract. Of course, as I've mentioned, the precision limits are determined by it. And typically, we'll, in, we'll be interested in how the precision limits scale with the limited resources that we have at our disposal. For example, a fixed number of atoms or photons. And you can show that there are uh, limits for when you just make use of classical resources without quantum entanglement and correlations that the best sensitivity will be given by one over square root of n scaling. Whereas in the quantum case, you can go all the way to a one over n scaling. So there can be a significant enhancement if you can make use of quantum correlations. But this, so being able to, to relate sensitivity to quantum correlations also gives us a different uh, way that this could be useful, namely for the characterization of quantum correlations. So just by comparing sensitivity to the limits of classically correlated states, we may be able to conclude about um, the correlations that we have. There's other applications related to that. For example, since the, the sensitivity scales with the quantum correlations, it will indicate um, when uh, some long range coherence or long range correlations emerge uh, in the presence of quantum critical phenomena. So this can be very useful to characterize quantum phase transitions and has been used, for instance, in the context of topological quantum phase transitions that are hard to characterize by other methods. And also for similar reasons, it is considered uh, a useful measure for the macroscopicity of uh, quantum superposition states, which is something that uh, Nicolas Sanguard is investigating. So now I would like to explain to you 
uh, how we can identify the limits on sensitivity of states that don't have quantum correlations. So let me just uh, very briefly review the idea of quantum correlations and the origin is in this historical paper by Einstein Podolsky-Rosen from 1935. And there's so many ways that this paper has influenced quantum information theory as it is today that uh, of course would be impossible to um, really review it completely. I would just focus on this realization that when you have a pure bipartite quantum state, you don't always necessarily can assign pure quantum states also for each of the local systems. Yeah, so this is what led Einstein to argue that quantum mechanics is probably an incomplete theory because uh, he didn't have a local quantum description. Um, but today we've gotten, I would say, quite used to this strange phenomenon and uh, we can attribute it to the presence of very strong correlations that are beyond the correlations that we can find in classical systems and in quantum information theory we work with this uh, weird phenomenon every day so the way that we de define it today uh, this quantum entanglement these strong correlations is as follows so if you have a system for which you can describe the quantum state of of two parties as a convex sum of product states so these are uncorrelated local states for each of these systems. And then you take a classical probability distribution just to describe classical correlations and to mix them together. If you can find such a description, then you say your state is separable. And when this is not possible, you, the state is entangled, right? So we know, uh, even though it may be counterintuitive that this is possible uh, from the EPR paradox, for example. Now, if I give you a density matrix and I ask you, is this separable or not? it's possible to show that it's a very hard problem. And uh, the reason is that you have to exclude all the possible descriptions of this type. And this can be really um, many. And so therefore, it's a, it's a hard problem and an ongoing topic of research in quantum information to this day. So we always need new methods that uh, identify states that are not separable, because it's important to recognize quantum correlations in all areas of quantum information. And this gets even more complicated when we go to multipartite systems. So in three parties, for example, they could all be separable from each other and they could all be entangled, but also we could have the situation where some of them are entangled and some are not. So you can see that this will quickly escalate into a, a hierarchy of extreme complexity if you go to n-partite systems. And for this reason, uh, we hope that we can contribute to this, this problem also using methods from quantum metrology. So the idea would be that we derive upper limits on the sensitivity of quantum states that have only limited correlations. And then if we see that the metrological sensitivity is actually larger than this limit, that allows us to conclude that there must have been correlations in, in the quantum state for which we have obtained this sensitivity. So this would be the idea of metrological entanglement detection, which I will explain now to you in a bit more detail. So in general, the, the motivation is also that uh, we know the larger the Fisher information, the better we can estimate a parameter. But there are limits for how large the Fisher information can be, and uh, we can derive them using nice mathematical properties of this function, which are convexity and additivity. And you can show, for instance, that if you have n particles that can be in one of two quantum states, like the situation I've shown you before in Ramsey spectroscopy, the limit will be given by the number of particles if they're fully separable. Right? So if they are really, each of them is uncorrelated from the other. But you can also show that uh, if you allow groups of particles to be entangled up to size k, then there will be an enhancement of a factor k. So this would be the picture for k equal one, but if you pair them together in groups of two that are entangled, you can get a factor of two enhancement of your sensitivity and this, this scales with the number of entangled particles. And you can see that the maximum, the scaling of one over n, which is given by Fisher information that scales like n square, will be given when all the n particles are entangled with each other. So this gives you a lot of information. It shows you quantum correlations are able to enhance the sensitivity of measurements and we can look at the sensitivity of measurements to detect and quantify quantum correlations um, by observing that the Fisher information is larger than these bounds, we will be able to, to identify the number of entangled particles. But sometimes this is not enough. So in quantum information, there are many applications that really rely on the exact 
knowledge of which parts of the system are entangled and which are separable. And uh, just the number of entangled particles doesn't tell you that. So for that reason, we have developed a generalization of these um, entanglement limits. And we've shown that uh, the, if the state is separable, an upper limit of its sensitivity is just given by the product of its marginal distribution. So here we have just uh, taken the product state of all of the reduced density matrices. And if you take this state and uh, determine the variance of the generator that, that imprints the phase, then uh, this variance will be the upper limit. And this is the most general bound that you can find for entanglement uh, on the quantum fish information. It reproduce, reproduces these other bounds as well. And it's applicable also to arbitrary dimensional systems where this one is limited to spins. So uh, just uh, um, what would be interesting now is if we compare these uh, entanglement limits, these separability limits, not only to the fish information, but also to the squeezing bounds that we've seen before. Uh, and if we put this together, so if I just put this variance on the other side, then uh, this takes a very interesting shape because this looks like Heisenberg-Robertson uncertainty relation. The only modification here is that I've taken the product of marginal states here. So this, this is not the full quantum state that I have to use to calculate this variance. If I took the full quantum state, that would mean we really have the Robertson uncertainty relation and therefore no state would be able to violate this. But this is an inequality that can be violated. And if we violate it, we know the state is entangled. So this is a simple way to characterize this metrological entanglement and to use it for entanglement detection as well. So you can show that the, the standard um, spin squeezing entanglement criterion is a special case that can be recovered kind of in the worst case scenario from this approach. And this has the additional advantage that it also tells us exactly which parts of the system are entangled. And it is applicable, it is applicable to unbounded operators as well. So we can apply this to continuous variable systems. Uh, I just want to briefly show you here um, an experimental collaboration where we did apply this to a continuous variable system. This is a quantum optical states and the quadratures are described by continuous variables. In this experiment, they produced a series of squeezed uh, quadratures and then mixed them on the beam splitter. And that gives you an entangled state that is known as a cluster state. Those states are used for quantum computations with continuous variables. And we used our method to verify that uh, these states are inseparable across all of the possible multi-partitions. So we can split the system in all possible partitions and check whether in these partitions there will be entanglement or not. And we found entanglement in all cases as a function of some tunable noise parameter that uh, has been introduced in the experiment. Okay, so, so far I have um, mostly focused now on applications where we really make use of uh, strong quantum correlations to enhance the sensitivity or, the, or we use sensitivity to detect quantum correlations. But uh, we should remember that this theory has a much broader scope of, of possible applications. And uh, it's not always necessary to talk about strongly entangled states to, to get something useful from the theory of quantum metrology, because it, it tells us in general, for example, how we can choose optimal observables in, in general quantum measurements. So sometimes we, we may not, able, not be able to control the quantum state, but we still might be able to control the observables that we measure. And to, I want to give you a completely different example from a uh, completely different uh, background, namely the resolution of two uh, incoherent light sources that have a finite width and they're recorded here on an image plane and they're separated by a distance d. And our goal is to estimate the value of this distance d. So you can imagine that this is an important problem in astronomy and microscopy because it determines the, the sensitivity of optical measurements of um, imaging systems. And the typical way that we do this is by performing an intensity measurement so that you collect the intensity in the image plane. And from that data, we try to estimate the value of D of interest. So we can treat this in the framework of parameter estimation. At this point, it's classical because you have a fixed measurement. And what you obtain is that the sensitivity as these two sources get closer and closer together will drop down. And this is typically known as the Rayleigh limit and is known to be due to diffraction. 
So this is basically a classical problem. We have classical sources here. But uh, in, in 2016, the group of Manke Tsang, they have uh, said, well, essentially, even though these states are classical, there are still quantum states. So let's treat this problem as a quantum problem and calculate the quantum fish information. So the quantum part means we have maximized overall measurements. And what they found is that it's independent of the separation between the two sources. So that means, in principle, there should not be such a limit. This should be an artifact of, an un, of a suboptimal choice of measurement. And they've also shown that an optimal choice of measurement is uh, achieved by doing a mode decomposition of your image plane. So you, you decompose it into spatial modes, like these uh, Hermit Gauss modes, and then you measure the intensity in each of these modes. And from that, when you measure really a full set, so infinitely many, then you will saturate this uh, and you will get an optimal measurement for the estimation of D. If you're just interested in, um, in small separations between the sources, for small D, it's enough to just measure the first excited modes here. And so this is something that is really interesting for experiments. And uh, my collaborators at LKB, Claude Favre, Nicola Traps, they actually have a device that can implement this mode decomposition. So they, they are interested in performing and they actually did this measurement recently. But what is the problem in all practical implementations is that there will be some imperfections in the measurement. So there's some probability to have crosstalk between the modes. And we were wondering how much uh, does this crosstalk influence this result? So is there some new limit imposed by, by realistic implementations of this? For this reason, we developed a method for the description of generic crosstalk. As a function of crosstalk, using some random matrix tools, we came up with a generic model. And we were able to show that uh, if you have crosstalk, no matter how small it is, as the two sources set, uh, get really close to each other again, at some point this uh, sensitivity will break down again. It's still much better than uh, intensity measurements, but you get the breakdown of sensitivity here. And this has also important implications for the scaling of the smallest distance that you can still distinguish from the noise. So when you did an ideal measurement without noise, then the smallest resolvable distance would scale like one over square root of n. This is the classical scaling that we use to, because uh, these are also classical sources, so we don't expect any better here. But in the presence of any non-zero crosstalk, we, we were able to show that the scaling changes and will will uh, switch to a one over the fourth root of n scaling. So you get a much worse resolution eventually. So of course, uh, there's a prefect that it depends on how much crosstalk you have. And in realistic models, this is still um, a very good measurement. Um, so there's a lot of open questions also on this problem, like uh, what happens if we use quantum sources? What happens if we really want to resolve an image? What uh, if we have several sources in an image plane and we'd like to estimate all of the positions and coordinates? Now, in this case, we'll come back to this problem of multi-parameter estimation because th these are problems that are no longer characterized by a single parameter. Right, so what I've been talking about so far was the theory that we have for the estimation of single parameters theta, which as you can see is a rather well-developed theory. But now as we go to multi-parameter problems, we, we will see the limits of this theory. So first of all, to characterize the sensitivity and the error of a multi-parameter estimation problem, we need now to move to a matrix. So we no longer uh, rely on a single number that tells us how sensitive we are. And uh, for this matrix, we can still define uh, sensitivity limits as the kramer rao bound. Uh, but now they are matrix inequality. So the, this is the inverse of the Fisher information matrix in analogy to what we've seen before. And this would be the inverse of the quantum Fisher matrix. Now there's, however, a huge difference to the single parameter problem, namely that we can formally write down the quantum Fisher matrix, but we cannot identify a measurement that will actually saturate this. This is a really uh, big problem in this, in this area. The reason is that for each of these parameters, you may get an optimal observable that may be different. And if they don't commute with each other, and which is gen generically the case, then you cannot measure all of them at the same time without disturbing. And therefore, you cannot 
do a measurement that is optimal for all parameters simultaneously. However, there, there are situations where we can circumvent this problem. For example, if we consider uh, a multi-parameter scenario where all the parameters are encoded locally in different modes, so the generating Hamiltonians here all commute with each other. And in this situation, we can saturate these bounds, and this has allowed us to identify the sensitivity limits for uh, generic problems of this form in, in multi-parameter quantum metrology. And what is interesting here, um, in, for each parameter, you basically have a small interferometer. So you can use the single parameter theory that I've shown you so far to understand how the entanglement between the particles that enter can improve the sensitivity for such a parameter here. But on top, we have now different modes in which the different parameters are encoded. And we can also think of the quantum correlations between these modes and ask if that can give us an additional advantage on top. And uh, we, we could show that if you have entanglement between these modes, you can actually get an additional collective quantum enhancement from estimating all parameters simultaneously instead of uh, one after the other. So important applications of this theory are, of course, um, multi-mode interferometers in optics, for example, but also you could think of a multi-mode Ramsey spectroscopy setup where if you have an atomic ensemble and you split it into different spatial modes that are addressable, then you could use each of these local ensembles for Ramsey spectroscopy, like in an atomic clock or an interferometer. Um, but then you still have non-local correlations between the spins between these uh, different modes. So this could be used for this uh, collective quantum enhancement. And there's a lot of uh, groups that are interested in this and uh, working very hard to towards um, setups of this type. Uh, two years ago, there have been three groups that have achieved to prepare a squeezed ensemble of uh, both Einstein condensates with uh, spatial resolution by splitting the ensemble into several small micro traps. And this has potential applications in the sensing of electromagnetic, electromagnetic field distributions, and of course in quantum imaging, as I've discussed before. And uh, since it's hard to find achievable bounds on the sensitivity in these problems in general, we were motivated to, to reconsider this idea of squeezing. So can we get simple, accessible, lower bounds on a multi-parameter sensitivity from squeezing in an analog way as we did for uh, single parameters? And uh, so we, for this reason, developed this approach that identifies saturable lower bounds as a function of a set of observables that you can measure. So you can just pick a set of observables that all commute, and you say, I measure these observables, and uh, from that, you can always identify with this method a lower bound on the sensitivity. And what's interesting is that we, we see that the sensitivity lower bound or the sensitivity we obtain scales inversely with the covariance matrix of these observables. So you remember from before in the, the idea of squeezing was that one over the variance is related to the sensitivity. So when the variance gets small, we get the better sensitivity. And this is kind of the matrix version of this result. Yeah, and we, we can apply this, for example, now again to the Ramsey method that I've shown you in the beginning. And in this case, the, the sensitivity, so remember that in multi-parameter problems, sensitivity is now described by a matrix, a covariance matrix of errors. And in this case, with this method, the sensitivity bound from a local measurement of angular momentum operators in each of these accessible modes will give you a squeezing matrix that looks like this. And to, can be used in a similar way by using a matrix inequality to identify entanglement metrologically. So what is the information that this matrix gives us? On the diagonal, we, re we recognize that we recover exactly the Wineland spin squeezing parameter that we know. So this gives us all the information about the enhancements that we can have locally in each of these in, um, modes for, for, for each single parameter. And that can be related to the particle entanglement. But on top, we have the off-diagonal parts. And these really characterize the multi-parameter gain. So this is due to the entanglement between the different interferometers, between the modes. So the squeezing matrix combines both of these uh, pieces of information. 
in one quantity. So let me also now um, address some of the ideas to solve, of the, solve some of the more outstanding uh, remaining problems in the field. Uh, as I've mentioned, the main problem is that these bounds are not saturable, and that means in really in general non-commuting gener uh, in the case of non-commuting generators, the the scrammer row approach based on efficient information is actually of limited use. It just tells us you can never get a sensitivity that is better than this, but it doesn't tell you what is the sensitivity we can get and what is the best measurement. So at this point, probably we need a completely new approach, but it, nobody really knows how to do it so far. So this is a very active area of research in quantum metrology, uh, where we've also uh, tried to contribute. And one idea we had was also to pursue further this idea on the squeezing, because we know that this gives us saturable lower bound, uh, bounds. This one is not saturable, but this may not be optimal, but it's saturable. And in some situations, we, we are able to optimize the, the observables that we can measure. For example, if everything commutes, we can optimize them. Um, so the idea would be, can we develop a method that allows us to optimize these observables also for non-commuting generators? And that would be very interesting because it potentially could identify some saturable bounds that are already optimized in some way. Other ideas would be to generalize the idea of the Fisher information because the Fisher information basically is a quantity that has only meaning in the asymptotic limit. So when you take a lot of measurement data, classically there are a lot of bounds in parameter estimation also known that are valid beyond uh, this limit. So when you have a finite signal to noise ratio already, and they're very, very interesting, but not so much is known about them in the in the quantum case. And I would be interested in, in finding the, the quantum versions because this would allow us to to study new approaches for multi-parameter estimations where maybe we just take a finite sample of data of one observable and then we switch to another that um, maybe doesn't commute with the first one. So these are some ideas for future directions. And we also have reasons to believe that in this case, in the multi-parameter setting, stronger correlations than entanglement could also become important. And these are also subject of intense research in quantum information theory. So these are known as einstein podolsky rosen steering is, is known to be a stronger form of entanglement. And also those type of quantum correlations that violate Bell's inequalities, those are typically used in quantum communication protocols to get the ultimate level of security. And uh, it would be really interesting to be able to relate them also to multi-parameter estimation situations. And this could also be an uh, ideal uh, starting point for collaborations, for instance, with Nicolas Sangual. So with this, I'm at the end of the presentation. I would just uh, conclude and, and summarize in a, in a very schematic way. So what I've talked about is quantum parameter estimation. And at the center of this theory is the metrological sensitivity of quantum systems that can tell us a lot about the quantum correlations of the states that, are, that we're looking at. So it goes both ways. The correlations can improve the sensitivity, but we can use the sensitivity also to characterize correlations, which is a very non-trivial task and very important in all areas of quantum information. And in general, this is a framework that allows us to identify observables and quantum states also in experimentally relevant situations or in all sorts of theoretical scenarios to get the best possible precision on a set of parameters that we're interested in, or at least on a single parameter. The field is pretty much motivated by all of the advances we had over past decades in the development of controllable quantum systems in experiments, and still the ongoing research is, is very closely related to it. And the theoretical foundation is given by quantum information theory, basically. So there's a very strong relation. This is essentially a subdiscipline of quantum information theory. And it has a lot of interesting applications. On the one hand, it's very useful in many situations to characterize many body quantum systems that are just too complex to, to characterize completely, but maybe getting some decisive parameters um, can be done with these tools. And it's also very relevant for applications in particular for the development of quantum technology and for the understanding of ongoing 
experimental efforts that we have. With this, I'm at the end of this talk and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Looking forward to your questions. Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Manuel. Manuel. Thanks. Uh, I think the sound is not very good, but uh, thank you for this uh, very impressive uh, presentation. Uh, lots of results and lots of questions for me. So <laughs> now we have time for uh, questions. So please, uh, uh, when you have questions, just uh, activate your microphone and uh, talk, or you can also send the question via the chat. Uh, session, the public discussion session. So who wants to ask the first question? Hello? Hello, Francois. Hello, Manuel. Do you hear me? Ah, yes. 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 Yeah. So I, I have a, a question, Manuel, if you don't mind. Um, thanks a lot for the for, for the very nice talk, very pedagogical talk. Um, I have um, several questions, but one of them that came into my mind at the beginning of your talk when you were um, um, discussing um, ways to improve uh, parameter estimation while using a higher order moment of uh, spin projection. Mm -hmm. um, this looks uh, ver very nice on, on paper, and uh, but the question is, what is the price for this uh, in, in practice? Because in most ex experiments so far, um, people only succeeded to uh, access low order moment of, of spin projection. Yes, let me see if I can quickly also find the slide. But um, to answer your question, yes, the, the, the main question is, of course, how can we measure these higher moments? And um, so there's there's different ways. So if you really have uh, a high resolution and you measure just a, a linear observable of this type, and you can look at the full histogram of your of your measurement data, then you can also extract higher order moments. This is something that that people can do with the measurements that that they have at the moment already. But the problem is that when you try to get a higher moment from this data. Of course, you will have a much higher level of fluctuations and noise. And the reason that's the reason that this is uh, complicated. But there are other methods that are really already being implemented that give access to nonlinear measurements effectively. And what people do is they put in a different nonlinear evolution before the measurement of an observable that is actually linear. So if you add another squeezing before you do the measurement, you can just measure linear moments, but effectively this maps to a measurement of higher order moments. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, this is known under the term of um, echoes, like uh, squeezing echoes. And this is something that, uh, for example, Monica Schleier-Smith at Stanford uh, has developed also experimentally. So this is something that can be done. And we're currently investigating uh, optimal ways to do these echo experiments and the scaling that we can expect with the number of particles uh, in a collaboration also with people at LKB from the, the atom chips group at uh, Jakob's, Jakob Reichel's group, and also the theory people there, Alice Sinatra, for example. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. if, if I may ask something here, uh, this is Antonio Sin. Yes. So you, uh, here you were playing with the observable, right? Introducing nonlinearities, as you said. And you didn't touch the initial evolution. Is it because it's optimal? Is, does it make sense to touch the, or it doesn't? Yeah. So the the evolution, in a sense, we already optimized um, because you can show that if you use a quadratic Hamiltonian together with a transverse field that has a very specific value of lambda, so the value is chosen in a way that you get exactly this this diagram. Uh, that uh, we have shown in this paper gives you the generation of squeezing on the fastest time scales. And the same is true also if you look at the quantum Fisher information for these states. So uh, on the fastest time scales, of course, within a limited class of Hamiltonians. So we, we have considered all Hamiltonians that are quadratic and linear. If you go to even third order, okay, then probably you can do even better, but this is still a bit beyond the reach of experiments. 
Yeah, but I was thinking like uh, you consider third order for the observable, but not for the evolution. So could you? Yeah, but uh, uh, measure, me measuring third order, I would expect still to be easier than generating a third order Hamiltonian because the second order comes from from interactions between particles, pairwise interactions. So to get the third order Hamiltonian in your time evolution, you would need to engineer three body interactions. And uh, I imagine that it's possible, but I also think this is much harder than uh, measuring third order moments from uh, from a linear operator, for example. Okay, thank you. Mm. Manuel, may I ask you something? It's not uh, uh, very much related to the technicalities of your talk, but um, could you expand a bit on what would you be your project uh, to, for example, work with Nicola or the group um, uh, at the spec? Mm -hmm. Yes, so um, with, uh, with Nicola, so Nicola, he uh, has a lot of um, background in these stronger quantum correlations that are necessary for um, for quantum communication, for example. And uh, as I indicated a, a bit at the end of my talk, we are also we would also be interested in identifying the role of these correlations in metrology measurements. So this could be something that I think we could uh, immediately discuss. Another possibility is um, for direct interactions would be um, using the sensitivity of quantum states to quantify the macroscopicity of quantum superpositions. And we've also been uh, interested in um, developing methods that will generate macroscopic superposition states. And the same also has been studied by Nicolas Sangward. And it is known that uh, the quantum Fisher information or, and also all of these approximations that we develop are in a way also measures of how microscopic is the superposition state in um, that you're looking at. So this could be also something we can immediately connect on, I think. Uh, with SPEC, uh, there are experiments, of course, by Daniel Estef. So there are uh, the superconducting qubit experiments. I personally have not yet worked on, on this platform, but I think the mathematical framework is not that different from the systems that I've studied before. Um, basically, you have the, the same uh, structure of the harmonic oscillator in the in the spin system in all of these experiments. So I think the mathematical tools will probably not be so different. And uh, I expect that it would be not such a sharp transition to, to move also to the theory of circuit QED systems. And then they are looking at uh, the coupling between these systems to, to other platforms as well, hybrid technologies that make use of, of spins, I think uh, also NB centers, if I un understand correctly. And those systems can be used very well for, for precision measurements and sensing. So I think there's a, there's a lot of um, points where we can start discussing about uh, also collaborations with the experiments at SPEC. Thank you. I also have a, a second uh, technical question. So uh, there were papers in standard, say, metrology. Uh, there were papers where people study the effect of errors and proving that sometimes you lose the Heisenberg limit. Yeah. And to me, it reminded me a lot the things you were saying for the diffraction problem by Tsang and uh, co-workers, so mm -hmm. your crosstalk. Yeah, yeah. Have you seen uh, how things are, these things are connected? And even people are claiming that sometimes you may use error correction to solve this loss of scaling or is there a connection there or do you are you aware of these works or yes yes i'm i'm aware yeah um for example also my collaborators at lkb have studied this in the past like alicia senata um yes so the uh i think um the scaling that we see in the imaging problem um yeah the 
the result is a bit different, I think, because uh, what you get typically in spin squeezing when you have uh, particle losses and strong dephasing is that the scaling is basically the, the classical scaling that you had before. You just get an enhancement that can be uh, a constant factor, which, which however no longer scales with n. But still, uh, this is something that uh, can still be interesting for, for experiments uh, to get this, this factor enhancement. Um, with error correction, yeah, the problem is that you need some redundance in your problem, right? So if you want to do error correction, you have to somehow um, operate on so something like multiple copies of your system to get uh, to encode one qubit that is an informa contains information into multiple physical qubits so that when you have an error, you can reduce it. Um, I have personally not uh, worked on that, but I know that there are results. Uh, but at this point, I don't think they, uh, they are really relevant for today's experiment and because of this redundancy that is also very challenging as far as I understand. Okay, thank you. So maybe, Manuel, if I can go on along this line, uh, I feel I, I'm personally interested in, in this activities are aiming to combine error correction and um, and um, metrology because this is a way for example to you know to extend from our metrology to the direction of computation or to extend tools from computation to metrology mm -hmm. okay can, can you can you can you do you have any idea of of i mean even if in practice error correction might not be yet useful for metrological tasks Mm -hmm. You have an idea of the kind of requirement, technical requirement, um, for making this um, practical, you know, to beat noise and eventually to get... Uh, yeah, so if I... ...authority scaling, yeah. If I, if I remember correctly, for, for error correction, yeah, the idea is to have multiple qubits that will just represent one. So I, I know a little bit about that from my background in trapped ion um, physics that uh, use error correction for quantum computations. And uh, what I expect is that you need access to the individual qubits. So I would guess in a metrology setting, um, a requirement would be to have something like uh, a quantum gas microscope where you can resolve individual particles and uh, manipulate their quantum states locally. And uh, this is something that uh, experimentally a lot of people are interested in, and um, I think it would be would be really interesting to see the the possibilities also for metrology of these uh, developments. So at this moment, uh, this may not be the, the their main motivation, and so with this connection through uh, quantum error correction, establishing a relationship maybe to quantum computation, um, yeah, I think it, it could be interesting. Thank you. Another question? Yes, I, I would have another question, Manuel, if you, if you don't mind. Um, no, no. Uh, so that, that, that is now along the line of um, EPA correlation and Bell correlation in, in, um, in metrology. So as you, I mean, this is known, I think, but, and, and you very nicely show it in your talk, that indeed you can connect a uh, concept like uh, entanglement and um, and um, um, metrologically useful um, states, at least in the single parameter estimation case. Um, what do you expect uh, or what could we expect in general from having stronger correlation than, than, than entanglement in the, mm -hmm. in the, in the multi-parameter case? Yeah, so one reason why I think we can expect perhaps to see a role of something like EPR steering in this context is that when you when you think of the EPR paradox, basically it allows you, if you have a bipartite system, to make a measurement on, on one part of the system and then project the other system in, in completely different quantum states that have completely different properties. So in one case, it may be sensitive to one parameter and in another case, it may be sensitive to a non-commuting operator. 
that is uh, complementary to it. So it's something that you cannot get without this EPR paradox. And for this reason, I would expect this to become relevant when we move to the non-commuting scenario. So at this moment, we have studied the commuting case and there we can still identify the role of entanglement. But um, for the EPR paradox, I think there's a possibility that it plays a role in multi-parameter settings. And uh, what concerns bell correlations, well, you have also yourself worked on this uh, witness on, on many body bell correlations and also Antonio. So um, there you already see that you can use quantities like uh, the spin squeezing in an atomic ensemble and relate it in some way to the many body uh, quantum non-locality or bell correlations, even though they are not uh, non-local. And um, yeah, I, I would be interested to see if we can extend this also to multi-parameter settings and also higher order moments and things like that. So I, at this point, I think what you've achieved is to use something that is related to spin squeezing, but is not yet related directly to the metrological sensitivity of these states. So you can maybe get a very conservative estimate um, that allows you to relate sensitivity to many body non-locality, but perhaps we can make this more precise and also related to the Fisher information. Yeah. Uh, yes. It's a more yeah. general. I'm from. My, I'm quite far away from the field. Um, yeah. Where do you see the field going in, uh, in 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 five to ten years? What do you see? What do you see yourself doing? Um, another way to answer to ask a question. It's something which uh, somebody got asked at an ERC interview. Um, over the next five or ten years, what's the Nobel Prize level idea which you'd like to solve? general yeah okay um so about this field what i what i would hope is that um on the one hand we find a lot of problems in uh, quantum measurement problems that so far we did not dare so to speak to ask about optimal quantum measurements like if you think of the imaging problem this is a problem that has been out there for years but nobody has considered the idea even to optimize over all possible quantum measurements in this scenario. But once once this formalism of metrology was applied, there's a huge uh, area of research now coming out of this. And this has uh, proven to be extremely useful. So I, I would expect that there's many cases like this still out there where people just did not yet uh, apply a rigorous theory of quantum measurements to identify what are really the limits and uh, to maybe find surprising results on how we can improve the measurements that we do today. So this would be this would be one case. The other point is that I think it would be nice to, to connect it better also to the other quantum technologies in a sense that um, perhaps we can come up with um, ideas of metrology also, for instance, in quantum communication, where you try to get some information from a different partner, but uh, you also want it to be secure. So you, you want to estimate some uh, information that is sent to you with the best possible precision. So you want to use ideas from metrology, but also you want to combine it with the security of quantum cryptography, for example, and uh, also as uh, Nicola has indicated in the connection with quantum computing and simulations there, I think could be a lot of fruitful interactions. So now the question about the, the question was, uh, what is the Nobel Prize winning idea that I would like to solve in five years? Did I understand correctly? Five or 10, five or 10. Ah, in 10, oh yeah. <laughs> Thank you, you're yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> No, I don't know. This uh, this is really a tough one. I mean, I could tell you a lot of things, but I don't know if it would be very convincing at this point. So, I, no, that's the whole I, point. You know, it, it doesn't need to be convincing. It needs to be visionary and bold. So, <laughs> um, well, if we again, okay, a Nobel Prize is of course um, Nobel Prize level. level. There are many things which are Nobel Prize level. Nobel Prize, you know, it's a lot of things, but you know, Nobel Prize level, something big and grandiose, something to have, you know your name in the textbook. I mean, 
Um, if you think about this, uh, the problem of, of multi-parameter quantum metrology, I think this is uh, extremely surprising that this problem here, which is extremely simple question, is still unsolved, right? So this is really something that we would like to make a contribution. Uh, the problem is we have a quantum system, it depends on multiple parameters. What is the best measurement to extract all of them? So nobody at this point can answer this question. And this is really um, what I would like to what I would like to be able to answer in, in five years. So what is the optimal measurement to get a set of parameters? And basically this means this would be the development of a real quantum measurement theory beyond just single parameters, but for multiple parameters. Thanks. That's very useful. Well, I had a question around that. So what is best measurement? I mean, what is the figure of merit? Is it clear to us what is? Yeah, yeah that, that's, a, that's a very good question, of course. Yeah, so it, it depends, uh, of course, on how you, how you characterize the, the, the sensitivity that you have. So typically what we do here for multi-parameter estimation is we look at the covariance matrix. But then the problem is that we would like to find matrix valued lower bounds on the covariance matrix that are optimal in a sense that we can get a matrix inequality and this is really the lowest uh, value of this error matrix that we can get so this is how we are approaching this problem at the moment in multi-parameter quantum metrology but of course there's many uh, different alternatives as well to how you could characterize the error so the, the the reason that this problem is so complicated is also partially due to this figure of merit because we have to work with matrix inequalities. We, um, you can find a lot of work being done where, where people just limit themselves to the trace of the covariance matrix, so the sum of all the individual variances. And um, then uh, you can, in many cases, find some bounds and some limits, but uh, I'm not so satisfied with this approach because you ignore already the fact that there may be correlations between them and so uh, I would hope to be able to get an answer also more generally. But then, of course, we can look at entropies, and uh, yeah, there's there's many alternatives as well, which we all should uh, should also question and consider. Other questions? Well, we have time. See a bit of time, but uh, remember that. Uh, Manuel uh, will be around in our virtual space uh, in the afternoon and the next day, I think. So there is some uh, virtual room session where discussions are organized already and uh, we can organize some more. So I had some few questions that are more technical, so I think we can discuss them. I will uh, discuss people <laughs> if I ask them. So I think uh, if. Uh, Everyone is happy. Uh, let me thank you again. Uh, I should have clapped at the end of the first talk. Let me clap for time. And you may have some. Like okay. And uh, so thank you. Uh, okay. Well, we have to improve that. <laughs> you know, to make it more cheerful. Maybe having a recorded clap. Well, anyway, thank you. Uh, so we'll meet, uh, Manuel, we'll meet uh, after lunch. I think we have a meeting scheduled. Um, uh, we yes, already. Uh, yes. And. Because uh, I have. Um, no, but just... with, uh, with Caroline about to discuss about the CERA and other. Yeah, yeah, okay. This will. Yeah, so we can discuss that. Yes. yes. Okay, so I, I meet you uh, soon. So yes. thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, all of you who attended the talks, and thank you for this very interesting, uh, stimulating, and uh, for me, uh, I learned a lot and I had many questions about your talks. And so, uh, so see you soon, and thanks all of you. The talk will be recorded, so it will be uh, well. You can read it online by reconnecting, well, listen at it by recording online on this uh, on this site, but. Uh, I try to make as soon as possible to make it available as a video, which is more uh, easy to, to have. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, Manuel.